All right, Sarah, thank you so much for being here with me today. You guys, you are really not going to want to miss today's conversation. Sarah has a great workshop prepared for us today, all about five tips to raise a reader during read aloud time. But first, let me just sort of introduce you a little bit to Sarah, our guest speaker here today. And I'm going to read my handy dandy notes so I don't miss anything. Uh, Sarah Miller lives in Michigan with her husband and her two children, and she's homeschooled her kids since birth, not the husband. In addition to being a homeschool mom, she is also an educator with over a decade of experience teaching kids in preschool through high school. Sarah's signature program, Reading Better Together, helps homeschool parents teach their kids to read with confidence using scripted lessons and side-by-side -side stories that make the process of learning to read fun. Sarah blogs at Homeschooling for Him, where she shares tips and tricks to make homeschooling simple and fun. Her advice has been published in national publications, including Parents, National Geographic Kids, and Yahoo Lifestyle. And you can also connect with her on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So I am going to get out of the way and let you guys focus on Sarah. And then we'll come back at the end with any questions you may have. Just drop them in the comments. Or if you're watching the replay, you can still leave your comments and I'll make sure Sarah sees those. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. I'm so excited to be here today, and I'm so excited to talk about this topic. I think that um, teaching our kids to read is so important, and it's something that can be so intimidating as a homeschool parent because it feels like there's so many steps and so many things to do. And so if we can make that process a little bit easier any way that we can, I'd love to be able to help do that. And I love the fact that we can use the process of reading out loud to our kids as a time to be teaching reading because that's something that we're all already doing anyway. And so if we can use that time to be able to teach reading during that time, all the better. So if you're watching, I'd love for you to say hey in the comments and let me know. Or if you're watching the replay, please type replay in the comments and let me know. And if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the comments and I'm going to try to try to watch and talk. We'll see um, as, as we're going here. So um, I just today I really wanted to share five different reading skills that you can teach your kids during your read aloud time because I know that we're really busy and so I want to make sure that we're really maximizing this time that we have with our kids when we're reading out loud to them. And the cool thing is that these are all little strategies that you can do during that read aloud time that don't require any extra time or really any extra effort, just a little tweak to what you're probably already doing in order to be able to teach the, these important reading and pre-reading skills to your child. So for each of the skills, I'm also going to share a classic children's book and kind of give a little example of how you can do that, because I think that's always really fun, too, to see how people are actually teaching these things with these real books. So let's go ahead and hop right in. And the first thing that I want to talk about is love of reading, because I think that this is the most important. And so I always want to start with it first. It's really important that we teach our kids to be strong, confident readers. But I also think that it's really important that we help our kids develop that love of reading. And if anything, that might even be more important than being a strong reader, because even if your child is a strong reader, if they don't love books, they aren't going to spend time reading and they aren't going to get the benefit. And so it's important that as parents that we're really helping and encouraging our kids to do both. And so that love of reading can start even when our kids are really young and can continue even after they are reading independently. And so our reading with our kids should also start when they're really young and continue after they're reading independently. No matter what age your child is, it's so important to spend time on a regular basis every day reading out loud to them. You can also be teaching your child things like how to hold the book and how to turn the pages. And when your kids are young, this is a really great way to get them engaged in the book. So when our kids are really young, our goal when we're helping our kids and when we're reading out loud to them is not so much that they necessarily are going to be picking up things out of the specific book, but we just want them to be having a really positive experience. We want them to feel involved and to feel connected with us and also with the book. And then that bond that, they, that they're having with us, the quality time that they're spending with us, and that love that they have for us is going to also kind of transfer over into the book as well. 
So when we're choosing books for younger kids, we want to make sure that we're choosing books that they are excited in and that they're interested in. So for our youngest kids, we can look for books that have flaps or touch and feel pages or um, any kind of activity to get them involved in the book. When my kids were super young, we had these books where you would open the flap and it would make a noise and they absolutely loved those. So any kind of books that are fun and exciting and will keep our kids interest are great for younger kids. And then also any kind of books that our kids are interested in are super helpful. The more that we can let our kids choose the books that they are reading, the better because they'll enjoy reading the book more when they've chosen it. So my choice for this one is Curious George and we have a super old beat up copy of this book, but I chose this one because Curious George is my son's absolute favorite character. He has a stuffed Curious George that he sleeps with, and so we love to read Curious George books out loud just because he loves Curious George. So I would just encourage you to think about what it is that your child really loves and try to include that topic in the books that you're reading out loud to your child. Because really the first thing that we want to be teaching our kids as we're reading out loud to them is just to love books. And we can do that by getting them involved in the process, by making sure it's fun, by spending quality time reading together, and by helping them get some choice in what it is that we're reading. So then once we've started to develop that love of reading, which can start when our kids are really young, eventually we're going to get to the point where our kids are learn to read themselves age or starting to be. And so the next thing that we want to really be working on with them is letter names and sounds. And this is something that we can do with read aloud books too. Learning letter names and letter sounds is the very first step in helping our kids become independent readers who can read on their own. And it's really important when when we're teaching reading that we're teaching kids both the letter names and the letter sounds. So for sounds, you can look for books that include alliteration or wordplay or rhymes, and you can incorporate some of those things into your read aloud time. Rhyming poems can also be a really great way to teach this. And then for letter sounds, any kind of an alphabet book that you can look for is a really great one. One of my absolute favorites is Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. And this is a story about a bunch of letters that climb a coconut tree. Um, and one of the things that I love about this book is if you get the little kid version, the cardboard book version, you only have the capital letters. But if you can find the paperback version, the bigger kids version, it actually starts with the lowercase and then they all fall down the tree and then they meet there. Where are they? They have the capital letters that get in here too. Oh. I don't know. I'm not finding it now. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. So they've got the lowercase letters. There they are. The lowercase letters are under the tree and then the capital letters are over here too. So you can talk about capital and lowercase letters together and talk about how those two different shapes, the lowercase shape and the capital shape, both represent the same letter and both make the same sound as you're reading this book. So any kind of a book that includes alphabet letters or has an alphabet theme is really great for this. There are so many really fun alphabet books that are holiday themed or that are themed for different seasons, and those can be really, really fun as well. So it's really important that we're working on those letter names and sounds with our kids, and that's another really great skill that we can be teaching just as we're reading out loud. So we can ask our kids, we can point to the different letters, and we can ask them what those letters are and see which ones they know, or we can share the names and sounds, or we can tell them the name and ask them the sound, or vice versa. So there's lots of ways to have really great interactive conversations with your child while you're going through these kinds of books that can be really great. So that was the second thing, teaching letter names and sounds. And then another really important skill that you can teach your child when you are reading out loud to them is word awareness and print awareness. And this one is actually really easy to teach. The only thing that you need to do is point to the words as you're reading to your child. So what we're teaching them is that the letters are combined together into words, and then the words and the letters represent something else. And this symbolic thinking of letters and words represent something else is not something that our kids are born knowing, but it's something that they have to know in order to be readers. And so it's really important that we teach our kids about words and we help them to be able to understand the print in the book. 
when we when we point to the words as we're reading, we're also teaching our kids things like that we read the text from the top of the page to the bottom and from the left to the right. And those are going to be really important skills for them to have when they're readers as well. So the book that I found for this one is maybe a less known book, but it's a really interesting book. It's called A Rebus. And I don't know if you've heard the name or not, but you'll probably recognize it when you see it. So the text in this book is really interesting because some of the words are replaced with pictures. So on this page, it says it stopped the, and then there's a little picture here of some cars, and the word in the book is supposed to be cars. It stopped the, and then same thing, trucks. So as you're reading this book, you can be pointing to the words, and then when you get to the picture, you stop, and your child is supposed to look at the picture and figure out what that is and say it. Um, this particular book, by the way, is The Big Snowball. This is part of a whole series of Rebus books that you can probably find if you go and look for them. Um, this particular one is really appropriate for me right now because I'm looking out the window at a snowstorm. But if you're in the South, maybe not so much. But um, I love this book because the kids can look at the the pick the words and follow along and they have to really follow along with you because then they'll know when it's their time to say he was as hungry as a and then you point your child says horse so I love this book because it really encourages kids to look at the words as you're pointing to them and it's helping them to be able to pick up all of those things about how the text is read and about how the words in a book work just by you pointing to the words this is called uh, print referencing, and it's something that's been shown in a lot of studies, actually, to have lots of benefits for kids as you're reading out loud. And so this is a really simple tweak that you can do because you don't have to do anything different or read any extra or spend extra time. All you need to do is just as you're reading, whatever you're reading anyway, just point to the words as you're reading. And that's something that can really be, really be valuable for kids, whether you have one of these Rebus books or not. But this particular one, The Big Snowball, is one of our favorites to read in the winter. It's a cute little story. Okay, so that's the third tip, point to the words, and it helps with word and print awareness. Another thing that you can really be working on when you are reading out loud with your child is reading comprehension. And this is one that is really, really helpful to practice when you're doing read alouds because it's actually easier for kids to learn reading comprehension when you're reading to them than it is when they're trying to read the book themselves, especially when they're new readers, because that process of sounding out all of the words and then figuring out what all those sounds are and remembering and then re holding all those sounds in their working memory long enough to blend it together and make a word and then do that for every word and get to the end of the sentence, like by the end of that, sometimes kids are exhausted and they just don't have any working memory left to try to remember what it was that they read at the beginning of that line. And so reading comprehension can be really, really tricky for new readers that are just learning how to read. And so that's why it can be really helpful to practice your reading comprehension actually when you're reading out loud to your kids and help them to develop those skills. And then over time, as they become stronger independent readers, they will be able to apply those skills that they learned when you were reading out loud to them to what they're reading on their own because they have the skills and then eventually they'll have the working memory to be able to do both together. There's a really cool little formula that um, some researchers have come up with for this and it's called the simple view of reading. And I wanted to write it down and show it to you so that you could see it. Um, this is what it looks like, and it came from a research study in 1986. And what they found was that decoding times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. So in this little formula, the decoding is all of the learn to read stuff, being able to sound out the words, being able to put the sounds together, and being able to say the correct word. And then language comprehension is all of the rest of it. So understanding what the word that they said means, having the vocabulary, having the background knowledge and the life experience to be able to understand what that book is telling them. And when you put those two pieces together, that those together make reading comprehension. They made this a multiplication problem on purpose because if you remember from math, whenever you multiply anything times zero, the answer is always zero, right? So if one of these pieces is missing, your answer, your reading comprehension here is going to be zero. So if your child can do all of the decoding in the world, 
but they don't have the background knowledge and the vocabulary, these language comprehension pieces to be able to understand what they're doing, then the result is going to be not reading comprehension. It's going to be zero, right? They're not going to understand. And the same is true in reverse. If they can't sound out the word, then they're also not going to be able to understand. So kids really need both pieces. And so that's why it's really important that we practice reading comprehension really intentionally with our kids. And read aloud time is a really great time to do that. So there's two different kinds of questions that I like to ask kids when I'm teaching reading comprehension or when we're practicing it together. So one of them is just a really basic recall question. So I'll ask, like, I'll read a page and then I'll ask something that they could answer super easily just if they were awake and kind of paying attention while I was reading it. And those questions, I'm just asking them to recall what it was that I read. I'm seeing if they're paying attention and checking to make sure that they understood the really basic facts of whatever it was. And then I'm also asking some more in-depth questions. So questions like, why do you think this happened? Or questions to help them sort of tie in whatever they're reading in the story with their own life. What would you do in this situation? Or what do you think the character should do next? So a book that I like to do for this one is Mike Mulligan and His Steam Shovel. This is one of our favorites at our house. My son went through a very long phase of loving all the trucks and wanting to understand all of the trucks. And so this book was really a favorite for a very long time. I think I had it memorized for a while. Um, so in this book, Mike Mulligan um, has a steam shovel named Marianne, and then all of the other steam shovels who are like more technologically advanced than Marianne come along and take all the jobs, right? And so we might talk about, you know, on this page, along came the new gasoline shovels and the new electric shovels and the new diesel motor shovels, and they took all the jobs away from the steam shovels. So our basic question might be like, what kinds of steam shovels were there? And they would hopefully be able to answer, you know, the gasoline and the electric and the the what the diesel motor. Um, I had to look back. So, um, but they would hopefully be able to answer the different kinds of steam shovels and it'd just be a basic like, were you listening or weren't you kind of question. But then the more in-depth question, so on the next page here, Mike Mulligan and Marianne were very sad. So then we might ask, we might get into that emotion and we might talk about like, why do you think they were sad? And would you be sad too? And what would you do if you were feeling sad? And, you know, just kind of getting into a little bit more in-depth understanding and, and applying it also to their own lives. So both of those kinds of questions are really important and really helpful for reading comprehension and definitely good to include sort of a mix of both as you're teaching reading comprehension to your child. So then the final piece here for us is vocabulary. And when I'm teaching vocabulary or when I'm thinking about vocabulary as I'm reading out loud to my kids, I'm just trying to read everything with a filter of their own experience. And so I want to make sure that whenever there's a situation or a word that comes up in the book where I'm not sure if my child knows it or not, I want to make sure that I'm stopping to ask, do you know what that is? Or what is that? And then providing a definition or an explanation as it's needed. So my example for this one is the book Corduroy. This is one of my all-time favorites. I have really fond memories of reading this when I was a child with my mom, and also I really loved reading this with my kids. But I picked this book because in the middle of the book, Corduroy, um, he's in a department store and he goes on an escalator. And I remember the first time that I read this to my kids, they were pretty young and they had actually never been on an escalator. We had been avoiding public buildings at that at that juncture because of world events. Um, and there's like one mall in our town that has an escalator. And to my knowledge, that's the only escalator in the, the entire town that we live in. So, um, and it's not a particularly small town. We just lack escalators for whatever reason. So um, my daughter had never been on an escalator. And so we got to this page and she looked at that and she's like, got this really confused look on her face. Um, and I realized that she didn't know what an escalator was. So we got to have a really good discussion about that word escalator and about the um, the concept of like how an escalator works and why you might want to ride an escalator and what escalators do. And so that's really important just to kind of think about what life experiences your child has had and what words your child might know and what they might not. And then it never hurts to ask as you get to a book and, you know, if there's a word on the page that you're not sure if your child knows, you can always ask them and check. 
And, you know, best case, hopefully they'll be able to just tell you and it'll be a great review and you'll move on. But if not, then it's a wonderful opportunity just to be able to reinforce that, that new concept for them. And this is something that you can be doing at any age too. So it's important to always be choosing books that might have some new situations or some new vocabulary in them for your child, no matter how old your child is. And that's one of the benefits as well of continuing to read out loud to your child, even after they're an independent reader, because you're child is going to, uh, you can still expose your child to new situations and new vocabulary that they maybe wouldn't be able to read on their own, no matter what their reading level is. So that one was corduroy, um, and the idea with that one was just vocabulary. So those are the five. As a quick review, we had love of reading. So that was encouraging our kids just to have positive experiences with books and letting them choose. Then we had letter names and sounds, and we talked about using the alphabet books to be able to teach those. Then we talked about pointing the pointing to the words as we're reading as a good strategy for teaching print awareness and word awareness and just sort of how books work. We also talked about reading comprehension, and we talked about that, that multiplication problem about how kids need both decoding and language comprehension to get their reading comprehension, and we talked about asking questions as we read, and then we ended with vocabulary, and we talked about introducing our kids to different situations that they might not know. So those are five strategies that you can teach your child as they are reading out loud with you and as you're reading out loud to them. And they're strategies that you can use no matter how old your child is, because your child is never too young for you to read out loud to them. And they're also never too old for you to read out loud to them. No matter where they are at in the learn to read process, reading out loud is always important. Sarah, this was so great. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and these tips with us, I think there were two things that really stood out to me. I think one, just sometimes, especially for maybe a new homeschool mom, the idea of teaching reading can feel maybe a little bit scary and overwhelming. Like it's something that you have to like be an expert and know a ton of things and go to school for forever just to teach your kid how to read. And you really showed us how a lot of those early reading skills and those pre-reading skills that we're setting up in our children can just happen so organically with the things we're already doing with our kids. And I hope any mom watching just oh, has this sense of relief, like I can do that. Okay, I'm already sitting, cuddled up on the sofa, reading a good book with my kid. And here are some, some ways that that's actually preparing them to learn how to read. I love that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm so glad you said that because I do think, you know, parents are our kids' first teacher and their best teacher. And we, as homeschool moms, I think on some level we know that, and that's why we've chosen to homeschool. And at the same time, there's some sort of like a mind game that happens with learning to read. And I, I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of know why it happens, but we, we get so caught up in like, we really want our kids to be successful, right? And it's so important that they love books and we don't want to screw this up. And, and that's great, you know, but it, it makes us so nervous to start. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that way. We've already had so many other successful experiences teaching our kids things and we teach our kids other, all sorts of other things, you know, so this is no different. It's just, we just need to know the steps that it takes. Yeah. And I also really loved that, that multiplication, uh, that you, the, the a little equation you showed us because mm -hmm. I can totally relate to that. I have uh, a child who's a struggling reader. And so sometimes after laboriously decoding a sentence, we'll have pretty much no idea exactly what's happened in the story. And I kind of have to review, okay, here's what you just read. Now let's move on. Cause right there, we're, we're really just focusing on like this decoding skill and to kind of remove that fear, like, no, we also have to have the reading comprehension at the same time to remember you can work on the language understanding rich and deep language sort of separately from something maybe that's more challenging for the child. Because that very same child of mine loves to listen to classic literature via audiobook and can listen at a much higher level and comprehend than is currently able to decode. And I think sometimes it's sort of like with handwriting. You know, we can combine handwriting with other subjects and maybe frustrate a child. And so just remembering we can separate out the challenging bit and focus on focus on some of those challenging things separately. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I had the frustrated handwriting child. So we did a, a, for a long time, we practiced handwriting. And then for every other subject, either I wrote the answers or we used magnets or whatever. I mean, there was, there was no handwriting in any of the other things. So yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> the I like to remember cool. that Milton, you know, who wrote Paradise Lost was blind and he dictated to his daughters. And so I feel like very vindicated to scribe for any child who needs to dictate to me. If it's good enough for Milton, it's good enough for me. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> well, yeah. Sarah, let me ask you a few follow-up questions. Maybe yeah. a mom is listening and is thinking, okay, this is like when I'm reading aloud and I can see how I'm starting to, to teach these children, you know, my teach my child these skills, but how do you know when your child is ready to learn how to read independently? Yeah, that's an awesome question because I feel like there's so much confusion about this because we think or sometimes we hear that it's dependent on age and really it's not. Um, it's And that's so hard as a parent because we feel like, okay, our child is to a certain age. Now we have to check off this next milestone on the milestone list, you know? And the reality is that the age when kids learn how to read is such a wide window. Um, so the research says that most kids will learn sometime between the ages of three and seven, but that's that's a large window. I mean, as a parent, like a four-year window to have to worry about, that's a really long time. Um, so I, I ra always recommend that parents, instead of focusing on the age, that they focus on looking for specific signs or skills that their kids have that are clues that they're ready to begin developmentally, because I think that's a more concrete way of knowing than just relying on that age piece. Um, and the acronym that I like to tell parents is the word ABLE, A-B-L-E, for the four signs. So the A stands for awareness. So that's what we were talking about um, a little bit earlier when we were talking about pointing to the words in the books. So that is if you're walking along and your child sees a sign, or if they see words on a t-shirt or a candy bar wrapper or whatever, do they recognize that it's a word and do they either say what it is or ask what it is? that's awareness. Um, and so maybe like if you're getting, pouring the cereal in your morning, in the morning and the child points to the box and it's like, oh, those are the Cheerios or whatever. I mean, they're not reading the word Cheerios, but they recognize that there are some letters there and that that word, that those letters, that word represents the specific cereal that's in the box, right? Um, and so that shows that symbolic thinking, which is super important in learning to read. And that's a really important step. So awareness is one. Books is another. So we just want our kids to have lots of exposure to books, which they're going to get from us reading out loud, right? So, and just learning how to hold the book, how to turn the pages, all of those kinds of things. And then letters, we want them to be developing those skills with letter names and letter sounds, because that's the first step. And then the E in ABLE stands for excitement. And I think that's the most important piece. We want our kids to be excited to get started and to be excited about reading, because the reality is that that process is uh, long at the beginning. And sometimes, depending on what we're doing, it can take our kids a little while to be able to see results. And so we really want that excitement that will help to carry them through those first few days and weeks as they're sort of starting to build those skills to be able to see the results. Those are really good tips. I think I would add to that, that if you start, I like to always stop the lesson, not necessarily at the end of the lesson, but when our attention is starting to go so that you yes. don't push through and kind of destroy like, oh, I don't want to keep doing this mom, but I would rather stop midway through a lesson and have better attitudes because it is, it's for the long haul. You just have to kind of view it as a steady plod, keep persevering kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're so right. And especially if reading is a struggle, I think that's a sign that it's important to make the lesson shorter. Because I think sometimes when our kids are struggling, we're like, okay, this is hard. That means we have to spend three times as long doing it. And, you know, we have to get that done. And as adults, like that is something that we maybe could sit down and discipline ourselves to do because we understand where this is going and we understand the importance of it. And we understand that if they spend 45 minutes, they're going to get to that book quicker. But a lot of our kids don't understand that reading that little line of words on that one page there is going to translate into them reading books books that they love. And part of that has to do with the, the choices that we're making as we're teaching our kids how to read. Like we need to find a curriculum that is intentional about showing that to them. But then also, you know, it's, it just, it takes time for our kids to get there. And so, especially when they're getting frustrated, it's so important that we stop and that we continue to keep it a positive experience. I'm yeah. so glad you said that.
Yeah. Well, okay. So we're starting with a child and they're starting to learn how to read. What in the world do we do first? Yeah, definitely. So the first step is the letter names and sounds. We talked about that a lot. Um, the research says that we need to teach both letter names and letter sounds that kids are better at learning letter sounds when they already know letter names. And the letter names are usually pretty easy for most kids just because they get the alphabet song and all that stuff and like all the preschool things. So that's a good place to start and then letter sounds from there. And then we want to be teaching them that reading is all about blending those sounds together to make words. I think this goes off the rails for a lot of parents when they start with sight words first because there's so many resources out there that encourage us to start with sight words first. But the reality is that when we start with sight words first and we have kids memorize words on flashcards, we're teaching them that reading is a process of memorizing words and then guessing. And that's not what we want to do. We want to teach them that reading is a sequential process of blending, sounding out the individual sounds and then blending them together to make words. I was actually, I was listening to something this week and they said that it's actually two different sides of our brain. So the blending, um, the sounding out the word and then blending it together happens in your left brain. And if you're memorizing a word by its shape, that happens in your right brain. So you're not even you're not even using the same half of the brain when you do that. I know, right? I was mind blown. Um, but you're not even using the same half of the brain when you're doing that. And so it's really, really important that we teach the blending first, because if we start with the sight words and then our kids realize that they can look at the first letter of the word in the picture and guess, or if they're doing one of those books where it's like, I like cats, I like dogs, I like fish, and there's a picture to go with each one and they're reading, you know, um, we're teaching them that they can guess. And at first that works really great, but then when they get older and those pictures that go along with the words go away, the whole thing falls apart. And then they're just frustrated because the only reading strategy they know is guess. When they're younger, it works great. And then when they're older, it doesn't work at all. Yeah, that is crazy. I did not realize that it is going on in two different sides of our brain. That's really, that's really amazing to think about. Yeah. Oh, you brought a lot of really great picture books, some of our family's favorites as well today. Do you have any other tips or suggestions for choosing the best read-alouds uh, as a family? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the things that I'm always looking for when I'm choosing a read aloud is I want something that's a little bit more difficult than whatever my kids could read themselves because I want to be exposing them to those new situations, new vocabulary, new experiences that they wouldn't be able to get if they were reading on their own. And so I'm always looking for books that are just really great examples of literature that will have those kinds of things in them um, and for a wide variety of just different topics and things. And then I'm also looking for things that'll be really interesting to my kids. So I'm trying to think about their interests and how those can be incorporated into that read aloud book as well. And then the final question, and we've talked about this a little bit, if you have a child who is struggling, we've talked about short lessons and not exacerbating, but what if you have a child who just doesn't seem very excited to learn how to read at all or interested or just even maybe horror of horrors, I know. I've actually had a child say this, I don't like reading. And my homeschool mom heart just like, oh no, I can't believe it. What do we do? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think the first thing with that is just to realize that that opinion can change, right? I had the same thing happen with my son. It was about a year ago. He was, math was a struggle every day and he was crying on a daily basis. And he looked at me and goes, mom, I hate math. And I was like, okay, that's it. We're done. We need to do something different. Um, and so we did. We stopped. We took a long break from math. We ended up changing curriculum and he loves it now. Um, so just to, to relax, take a breath, um, just because they said they didn't like it once or for a little while doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're going to raise somebody who's going to graduate from your homeschool and never open a book again. Like there's still time. It's still possible. Um, I think the biggest thing that can really help um, from what I've seen and from what I've read in the research is just to, to have a lot of books in your home and to have a lot of books available to your child. I read a study that said a steady stream of new age appropriate books can triple your kid's interest in reading. So um, that tells me, so the steady stream tells me you want to be going to the library on a regular basis as a part of your family's routine and checking things out. And then the new age appropriate books, you want to be choosing things that are appropriate for your child, right? So you want to be both in topic and and in reading level, I think, which can be really tricky, especially if your child's reading level doesn't exactly line up with their grade level. Um, 
on both sides. I have a child who is ahead in reading. And so the topic um, of the book has been a struggle. I've really had to preview books for him because there have been a lot of really not okay topics that I'm not excited to have in our home um, that are at his reading level. So um, yeah, so you want to choose books that are the right age level and the right um the right topic for your family, but then give your child as much choice as possible. I think the more that we let them choose books that they're interested in, the more that they will want to read on their own. And this actually works for adults too. If you think about your own reading, you're probably going to be a lot more likely to choose a book that's about a topic that you're interested in, that you chose yourself. You're going to be more likely to want to read that versus a book that somebody handed to you and said, okay, this is required. You have to read this now, right? And the same is true for our kids. And the other thing that's interesting is that our topics actually change over time. And it's kind of depends on, you know, what's interesting to us at the time or maybe what life situation we're going through. So we just recently booked a trip to Disney World. We're going to go to Disney World with our kids in the fall. And all of a sudden, like I've been checking out all the books on Disney World and I've been reading all the things about Disney World and all the podcasts and all the everything. Um, and six months ago, like I could have cared, I mean, I like Disney, but I really, if somebody had said, okay, you're going to read this Disney World book now, I would have said, no, I'm not. Um, and now I'm like, let me go to the library and check out all the Disney World books. So kids' interests will change as well. So just because your kid is, you know, reading all of the books about one particular topic now doesn't mean that it's going to be that way forever, although sometimes it can seem like it. They so might not be thing. obsessed with Ninjago forever. <laughs> That's a relief. <laughs> Theoretically, of course, right? <laughs> Completely random topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sarah, please tell anyone who is watching the video where they can find you all around the internet and um, what resources you may have. I know you have another class coming up this week, a free class about helping parents with reading, teaching in their homeschools. Yeah, definitely. So my blog is at homeschoolingforhim.com, or you can also find the Homeschool Reading Community Group over on Facebook. That's another really great place to connect. Um, and I would love to see you at the class this week. It's called Six Steps to Raise a Reader. And I'm going to be going through step by step the process that I used with my own kids and in my classroom as a teacher to teach kids how to read and just really trying to end the intimidation around the process of teaching kids to read. I really, I want to make it simple for parents. And so um, that's what I'm going to be doing at the class. So it's going to be a Tuesday night at eight or Wednesday afternoon at three. Great. And I have that link in the video description and I'll make sure to add um, as well the links to your Facebook group and Facebook page. And awesome. Anyone who, I think I actually forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of the video, but if, you know, I'm Amy Sloan from Humility and Doxology, and you can find me at humilityanddoxology.com or on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Humility and Doxology, where we love to talk all things books, poetry, memory work, homeschooling, and silly memes. So I hope to see you there. Thanks again, Sarah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy.